I asked uh, Brother Gary to sing that song because I wanted to build a sermon around it, stand up, stand up for Jesus. We learn from Colossians 3 and verse 16 from the pen of the Apostle Paul, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing another, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I want us in this study, if we can, to see how this song truly is edifying, spiritually building us up. Also, admonishing us to act upon what we know, and then even encouraging us to give attention to the meaning of the words and put them into practice in our lives. Originally, this song, as I understand it, had six lines to it, but I've never known but four of them. Somebody else may have known the other two. So we will concentrate on the four we have just sung, examining different parts of each line to see what we can learn from those lines and those words. Well, first of all, we have already said it, stand up. Stand up for Jesus. While we did stand literally and sing, that's not really what that song is saying. It actually means that we're to stand for the cause of Christ, that we're to be courageous, that we're to, wherever it's challenged, be prepared to deal with the challenges and to expose the error that is involved. Now, we all can't be the same way and to the same extent in being able to do those things. But every one of us as children of God and all that that means can be a part of it can in some way do it. Some of you may remember the debates that we had some years ago, and even though at that time I happened to be the one, in the case I'm one of the last ones we had doing the actual debating, look how many people we used in that to help. And that's the way it is and should be in the fellowship of the saints, not only when we're fellowshipping as we are now in the study of the Word of God or in the rest of the worship, but in everything we go to do when it has to do with the Lord. We are to be militant. Some people don't like that word militant. To them it brings to mind burning down buildings and riding in the streets, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means carrying forth that which is important and not letting it be dampened in any way. It means pressing it because there's nothing else like it. And, of course, when you think of carnal warfare, you think of the various ways that armies have fought over the years and how there have been charges and uh, landing on Normandy or on Iwo Jima or Okinawa or somewhere, the different movements that they would make. You think of the Ardennes Offensive, the Battle of the Bulge, and how the Germans had their counteroffensive and then what it took to take that back. Uh, People had to do tremendous things when it comes to carnal warfare to be able to advance and to be able to defend. So we need to be mindful of that when it comes to being ready when it's needed to stand up for the Lord. So don't just think of it as a posture of the body. Think of it as being prepared and ready to step forth. It really carries with it the idea more of contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, being prepared to do that. And we certainly are not accomplishing anything when we really oppose those things that have to do with exposing error and upholding the truth in the place of that error. Now the writer of the song continues, ye soldiers of the cross, and he says, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. Well, in the study of military history, I think we've all either seen depicted on the screen or read it in books where soldiers going into battle were carrying a banner, a flag, an ensign. In fact, there's another song, Ensign Fair We Lifted Up Today. 
I might want to sing that one toward the end. I hadn't thought about it, but that fit well. Uh, something that represents who they're fighting for, some aspect of it. And I didn't submit much to those soldiers. If the soldier carrying the banner were struck down, then another soldier would lift it up and carry it on into the battle because of what it represented, what it meant to them. Well, how much more so when we understand that we're not only the family of God, We're not only the temple of God. We're not only the body of Christ or the kingdom of heaven, but we are the army of the Lord. We can relate to this when it comes to our flag, the stars and stripes, old glory. The U.S. National Anthem talks about the star-spangled banner. When the morning light appeared, Our flag was still there. And we think about the raising of the stars and stripes in the battle of Iwo Jima on Mount Suribachi and so on. Uh, We cringe, in fact, or we should. I guess a lot of people don't nowadays. When someone mishandles or abuses the flag and thus disrespects it because of what that flag represents and the high cost in lives of the soldiers who defended it for our our freedom. Well, think about the church of our Lord. What brought it into existence? Why, it was the death of Jesus Christ. The offering of his sinless body on the tree of Calvary and the shedding of the blood of Christ to purchase the church of our Lord. And if you're a Christian, you're a member of that church because you were baptized into his death. And in his death, the blood washed your sins away. You rose a new creature, a member of the church, but a soldier in the army of the Lord. So there's a greater army than that of any particular country on this earth. And it is, as we have been speaking, the army of the Lord. As Christians, then we need to realize that when we become Christians, we sign up voluntarily. We were not drafted. We chose to become a Christian for a given reason, to become servants of God, to gain forgiveness of sins, to live so as to glorify God and have heaven as our home. So every one of us is a Christian soldier. Paul told the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in the warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now think that just for a moment. Entangles. We all are involved in this life, but we're not to be entangled. To be entangled reminds me of I usually think of the garden hose and you're out there trying to unravel it and trying to not get your feet wrapped up in it so it throws you down on the ground. Well, that's the idea expressed here almost exactly in the Greek, that you get so involved in this world you can't walk. It throws you down. And while we're in this world, we're not of this world. The things that motivate us as children of the living God, as soldiers of the cross, are the things that have to do with godliness. We can't go into all of them right here, but we need to know we're not as the carnal soldier fighting a physical warfare. We're fighting a spiritual one, and we must stand up in the sense we've described as Christian soldiers, and we must not turn our back to the enemy. We must face the enemy head on. You know, I wonder sometimes when we pray about it, as we did today, about this country and what has been and what's happening and what could be and what is in a lot of countries for they've never known what we've enjoyed in God's good providence for which I doubt we're thankful enough. But do we even know as faithful children of God and soldiers of the cross how to suffer persecution as our brethren did in the first century? Do we even know how to stand up and fight as Paul had to Uh, and has said that we are fighting not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, powers of darkness and heavenly places. 
that we're fighting against ideas, we're fighting against philosophies, we're fighting against Satan's false doctrines. That's what makes people evil, these things, and we're fighting against them. And thus, we have to be settled in the truth. We have to know what the gospel is and the church is and the different in both of them from the ways of the world. We have to clearly and distinctly see the difference. We have to know we have a royal banner that represents the righteous way and the hope of eternal salvation. So, in a spiritual sense, if one soldier drops the royal banner, or as one generation moves to another generation, then there are those who will hoist it on high, and all that that symbolizes, that they'll pick it up, carry it high, and march in the battle, because you can't have a greater leader than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so the song says, From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, for Christ is Lord indeed. Now, I don't know what you do on the job where you are and how circumspect you have to be with what you say, or how it is in school or you're with your neighbors, but in some way or the other, you're expected to be a faithful soldier of the cross before them in setting a godly example and the words you use with them. Are we trying to hide our Christianity from our friends and neighbors, even some of our family maybe? Or are we trying to find ways to express it? And when error comes up, to meet that error with the truth of God's good word found in the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus is the head of the church, and he knows how to help us in our time of need. He's given us all the tools we need to win against our enemies because he's given us the power of his blood. What do we get out of the song that says there's power in the blood? Power in the blood. And the song writer even emphasizes power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. So we need to understand the importance of Ephesians 6 and those uh, items of armor that are on, to be put on. Now, of course, Paul chose the armor of the day of the Roman soldier, and that's what you have described there. 2 Timothy 3.16, of course, says that all Scripture, speaking of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. You benefit from it doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Do we do that? Are we the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the leavening for good, when around about us we choose opportunities to say things to people regarding their conduct or the lack of it that's out of harmony with the teaching of the Bible? He says this is given that the man of God may be complete or perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. We all know that the gospel is God's power to save men from sin. Folks, we look around about us, we see all these different diseases and the wars and all of the whatevers that are taking place to us physically, and yet the greatest enemy you have or I have is sin in our lives. There's not anything in this world that can keep David Brown out of heaven, but sin in his life he hasn't repented of. There may be a whole host of things wrong with me otherwise, but the only thing that's going to keep me out of heaven is unforgiven sin. And that's the same for you and for every other person on this earth. It's the greatest enemy we have. So Paul says, for I'm not ashamed. Well, a soldier can't be ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. Whenever we resist the devil... And the only way you can in the faith, and faith comes from hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Then James tells us, James 4, resist him and he will flee from you. We have an advantage, and I like advantages. Maybe you don't, but I do. We have an advantage over the devil because Paul even says we're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his tactics. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. We know how he's going to come at us. You know, one of the tremendous responsibilities of intelligence when it comes to uh, a war or battle is trying to find out 
what their plans are. And so it is, if you can uh, know that, then the other side can make preparations and even circumvent it and change the whole thing. I remember it said of General Patton concerning Rommel, who was a tactician, who had studied the mechanical warfare, the tanks, and when they were fighting, something happened, and Patton said, I've read your book. Well, I've often heard Brother Foy Wallace, and I felt that way myself a few times, having read some things of those I was dealing with, but I already know where they are because I read the book. So you have to know your enemy. I think one of the greatest mistakes we make as Christians to be able to be faithful, do you know your enemy? Do you know how he's going to approach you? Well, Paul says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We can be prepared. We need to know how he tries to get us to break God's commandments. When Christ comes again, the wonderful thing about it for the faithful is that the final enemy, death, is going to be destroyed. I mentioned a few weeks ago the idea that God knows exactly how to get rid of all wicked things and the exact time to do it. The problem is man wants God to act upon his own time. Well, God's not governed by time. And God will call time to an end when he gets ready, just as he spoke it into existence when he was ready. There is no measurement in eternity of time such as we have here this day. You just are. Now, if there's any kind of measurement there, I don't know how to do it, and the Bible doesn't tell us. All I know is don't put God on your timetable because he's not. He's going to punish sin. He's going to destroy death. And he tells us he has and he will through Jesus Christ and Christ's resurrection from the dead and that when he comes again, it will be destroyed. I like to think of Christ's coming as the death of death. There will be no more death after Christ comes. It will all be over with for that kind of thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, Scripture says, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Now what's the last one? Well, Paul tells us. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now Christ has shown us that he has the power over death. And we're promised that we will be raised from the dead to die no more as well. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption... And this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades or hell, where is your victory? Now think about that for a minute. The carnal soldier having no hope in God, and maybe they don't, he dies for things of this world. I think about the Alamo those 185 or so men that were in that and no hope. There was thousands of Mexicans who were bent upon killing them. They made it very clear we're not taking prisoners. And yet they died down there without any thought of dying for the cause of Christ. Now, they may have thoughts about what Christianity was, but they didn't die like Paul died or Peter died, the martyr's death and so on. Yet they died for that. I think of all those thousands that died in Normandy or in Iwo Jima or anywhere. Some years ago, I was in, the, in Manila and saw the big cemetery there where they had brought from all over many places, all over the southeast uh, Pacific and buried a lot of folks there. Of course, a lot got buried right where they died. But it had big maps up there of all the places and so forth that had taken place. A huge place kept up by your tax dollars, very pristine and, and pretty, as all the great cemeteries are in the United States has anything to do with. And I thought about then all these people died. All of them, probably the average age might have been 20. All of them died. And I had a daddy's oldest brother died in a kamikaze attack off Okinawa. All those people, all those people, and yet they didn't die for the spread of the gospel. They didn't die for those things. They died for things of this world. 
how much more so in the army of the Lord and Christians in, in particular. What we have to die for, we won't stay dead. Oh, death, where is thy sting? We'll rise again. When you go to a cemetery, you look out there and you realize Christ can get you out of that grave to die no more. Then we have stand up. Stand up for Jesus. The trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Now when we read about battles of old, it was common for them to begin their attack with the sound of a trumpet. And we know usually the one that was used by the American cavalry because it gets sounded when some football team's on the vance. ta 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 and you know the rest of it. Well, they've always had some sort of bugle call like that, and they still use bugle calls. There was a time when that was the best way they could to be heard. No modern communication. Sometimes they would use uh, certain drum beats to call people to do certain things, but most of the time it was the sounding of a horn or a trumpet. And so that kind of thing is used. Paul even used it in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 8 where he talked about an uncertain sound, talking about their misuse of, of languages, the miraculous languages. He said, now if an uncertain sound takes place, what, what do the soldiers know to do? They don't. It's confusing. So he's talking about the need of clear language so you can understand it. Well, as a soldier in an earthly army will obey the commands of his leaders and not question their orders, then we must not question or rebel against the orders given to us by our commander in chief, who is Jesus Christ. Now, I know no matter how good human commanders are, they can get things mixed up and do the wrong thing. But I'm not talking about that when it comes to Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, who is God, and who knows what's what. There's no mistake there. When he tells us to go forward, it's time to go forward. When he tells us to charge, it's time to charge. So we must learn to respect the chain of command, if you want to call it that, and realize that God has all the wisdom and God has all the answers. And we must learn to trust God, relying on his wisdom and not our own. Otherwise, we're going to lose this battle against a terrible enemy. How could we ever expect to win against Satan without someone like Jesus? The, Apostle Peter, the apostles Peter and John we're told plainly not to speak about Jesus anymore by those Jews who opposed them at one particular time. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Listen to me. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard, Acts 4.19. Now, if you'll remember the whole of the context, they knew these weren't highly educated men, but the scripture says they knew they had been with Jesus. Men can kill us physically, and they do, and they certainly persecute us one way or the other. But they can't touch your soul. They can't touch my soul. They can't do it at all. So we're not to fear man. We are to fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. No matter that at times we may think that things are bad and things are broken down and how am I going to make it? And we sort of have a pity party and oh, woe is me. But we need to refresh ourselves and know that all the strength we need is found in the Word of God and our confidence in it. And God with us. 2 Corinthians 4.16 reads, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. What about the inward man, the spirit? 
It's being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, I think of all Paul went through, and he said it's light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. I am fully convinced that a lot of folks, barring any sort of uh, addictive drug or tumor or blow to the head, the particular depressions that people get themselves into many times are because they lose hope. Well, it's just never going to work. One of the great things that proves God's love for us is that he let us loose to make our own decisions. Think about that for a minute. God didn't have to do that. God could have said, because he knew all that he could, that's possible to know, he could have said, now, well, I need to keep him, I need to keep him or her under my wing for another five years. Or I'm just not quite ready to let him go yet. God did. And one of the great challenges that parents face is to let their children grow up. Now, you folks with babies, you don't understand that. Because you've got to let your children grow up. You'd think it very strange, and you'd be greatly upset if your child always remained four years old. Besides it driving you crazy, they're always four years old. Always going to have a four-year-old. Well, there are a lot of four-year-olds that are just matured physically. They're really 25 or 30 or 35. What's wrong with them? Their parents won't let them go. Their parents won't let them stand on their own two feet. And when they fall, they won't be there to help them up, they don't want to let them fall. They don't want to let them be mature. And if they would think for a minute, some of the things, some of the things that they abhorred the most in their own life is the very thing they do to their kids, micromanage. It won't work. God doesn't even do that. And you can't outlove God. And you can't love your family beyond that. So in our living for the Lord in the church, we have to learn to fortify one another so we can each stand like David did. Who was standing with David besides the Lord when he met Goliath? As far as I know, it was just David standing there. But it was his knowledge of God being with him and how God was with him that made him do what he did and serve as an example. And if that's not standing up for the Lord, I don't know what is. Then stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. David knew that. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. When we stand for Jesus, we need to realize, above all else, I am not alone. I have never, in all the times I've done what I've done publicly, whether it's preaching like this, whether it's teaching a class. But I tell you, more than ever where it's been is where I felt like I was doing more of the Lord's work any time in my life, and that is standing on the polemic platform exposing error and upholding the truth to a vast audience of people. I never felt alone. God was my right hand, and he was my strength and my ever-present help in time of need. Why should I feel that way? The Bible tells me to. And I can know the truth and know he's with me, invisibly, but he's there. So we stand with Jesus. We don't stand alone. We rely on, if we rely on ourselves, it'll fall apart. We won't get to first base. We're trusting in the flesh. But when we learn to trust in God and allow him to work through us by our obedience to his will, we can accomplish great things. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 37, 1, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also 
in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. The Lord arms us. He tells us what to think about, what not to think about. People may and do fail us. That's one of the things you've got to realize. Your family can fail you. Your best friends can fail you. But God will never fail us. And again, the psalmist says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Psalm 146.3 Again, the prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 12 in verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Now, Paul understood that message. Therefore, he said that he could do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth him, Philippians 4.13. The amazing, great, bold prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, 7, gives us a good illustration of what a child of God is like when he allows for the strength of God to be with him. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That ought to mean something this summer. (laughs) The writer of the song goes ahead and has more things to say concerning the strength of God. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto prayer where duty calls or danger be never warning there well back in those days when armies met there was hand to hand combat and that wasn't pleasant indeed armor was important people had to be trained how to use their armor how to wear their armor you'll remember when Saul said come up here David you can wear my armor David said that I'm not proven with this. I don't know how to do that. I'll have to use what I have. Well, of course, he really addressed himself in the strength of the Lord. That was his armor. But the point is, is that when there was armor, the people had to know how to wear it and what it was designed to do and how to use it, even a shield. Well, even today, a soldier's dress is important. Soldiers are trained to fight, and they're given the proper body armor, tools, and so forth, even today, but especially back then. And it all comes down to this. It's all a part of being prepared, no matter how dangerous their mission may be. The same thing's true when it comes to the Christian soldier. We must train ourselves from the Word of God so that we can know the enemy and know how he works and know how to meet him, however he comes at us. And Paul explains that in Ephesians 6 which is what this song we're studying is really based on, you know. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, listen to Paul writing to the church, the army of the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, I could have been written in the Old Testament, couldn't it? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness and the heavenly places. Therefore, and I must do it and you must do it, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having an all to stand. Stand therefore, having your waist... Uh, girded with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then notice how he thinks of himself. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, you can spend a lot of time studying those scriptures to try to milk it for everything it's worth. One thing that comes out of this, there's no substitute for daily training with the sword of the Spirit. No substitute at all. And all the armor that we're to put on comes out of your proper knowledge of the Bible and exactly what goes on. Now notice, stand up. Stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle. The next the victor's song. To him that overcometh, crown of life shall be. He with the king of glory shall reign eternally. There's some of us old enough here to know that it only seems like yesterday we were getting out of high school or out of college or getting married or raising little kids, and now that's been a long, long time ago. But it doesn't seem like it. And there's others of you who are thinking, well, yeah, and the next thing you know you're going to be saying, well, I remember him saying that that day or somebody. And now it's here. God has his infinite wisdom made it in such a way as that time goes by and time goes by easier when you're trying to lend your life to doing God's will. It's all going to go by regardless of what you do. and It's going to go by in a hurry, and it does. And we need to know, as was said in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, that at the end of this life of the faithful soldier of the cross, there is a crown of life for the victor. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Paul says, Don't you know that those who run in a race all run, but there's only one that wins. One gains the prize. And that's the way we ought to be running. And everyone who completes, competes for this prize is temperate you know, and self-controlled in all things. Now, notice how he makes the application. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. Now I want to end here with several passages from the book of Revelation. Jesus said in Revelation 2, 10, that we're not to fear those things which we are about to undergo. They were at that time because of their faith in Christ. He said to them at that time, indeed the devil's going to throw some of you into prison and uh, you're going to be tested. He said you'll have tribulation 10 days. Then he says, be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life. Uh, do we know how to go through that and remain faithful and stand up for Jesus? In Revelation 2, 7, the scripture says, To him that overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Do we know how to fight the fight of faith that we can? In Revelation 2, 11, He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. You know, there's three deaths. One, we choose to undergo in obedience to the gospel and be baptized in the death of Christ. We die to the practice of sin. We're raised to walk in newness of life. The second death, the Lord has not come. Every man must die, Hebrews 9 and 27. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. But the third death is... No one must undergo it. I'm afraid most will. It's eternal separation from God and eternal death. But for the person who underwent the first death in baptism, that is, baptized the Christ for the remission of sins, and who live faithful, they don't have to be concerned about the second death. In Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on is the way we look at it. Yeah, says the Spirit. Yea, says the Spirit. That they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. We need to learn 
to stand up, stand up for Jesus. Strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor's song. James says that life appears just as a vapor for a little while, then vanishes away. I like it like that. It makes me even closer to the day of the reward when I see how fast this life of the flesh is going on. Don't put your anchor down here. Stand up and be counted for the Lord and live a righteous life that heaven will be your home. If you're not a child of God, we beg you to obey the gospel this afternoon. A child of God, if you haven't been standing up for Jesus or sins crept into your life some other way, we urge you to repent and pray that God will forgive you having confessed those sins. And do it now while we stand and while we sing.